here's this weird looking monster creature that's just kind of monstering, right? Now write music for that. It's like, <laughs> what? what? <laughs> For those that don't know you, what is your name and what are some of the games that you've worked on? Hey, yeah, well, I'm Will Roger, Wilbert Roger II. Um, I'm a video game composer. I've written most recently for Mortal Kombat 11, Star Wars, Vader Immortal, and uh, Call of Duty World War II. Do you go into your compositions with the intention of having an emotional impact on the player? Yeah, you know, that's usually the first thing that comes to mind, is the emotional center. Um, but one of the interesting things about game music is that we can do a lot more than that. Um, you know, you enter a level and uh, the player is almost like a collaborator, because they have to get from point A to point B, they're not just kind of sedate and passive like in film or uh, television. And so what's interesting is you can actually have a dialogue with the player, with the music. So you can say things like, hey, the music has changed from the normal, let's say, puzzle music. This is something we did on Lara Croft. The music is different, and it's our way of letting the player know, hey, this might be a little challenging. And we understand that, and uh, we want to put your mind at ease, give it, a, give it your best shot, you're not alone. You can have character themes or light motives, and those character themes can be used to indicate the presence or even the influence of another character. Uh, so for instance, on Mortal Kombat, um, the main antagonist is Kronika, and oftentimes she's influencing other characters on screen with her empty promises of whatever. Uh, even though she's not present, you can hear her theme sort of hinted at in the background. I'll give you one guess. Dad, your, your arms, those look like Kronika's design. What are you doing? Giving you the life you deserve. Speaking of Mortal Kombat, uh, yeah, you composed the main theme and the story mode music. Uh, what was it like working on such a legendary franchise? I think Mortal Kombat 11 is quite special in that this is, as far as I know, the first time that we've gone back to the digitized characters. Um, you know, obviously we had MK1 through 3 where they were just photos of people and then you know, the artist obviously edited them to, edited them to work in the game. but from four until 10, they were uh, 3D models, but they were painted 3D models. So they weren't necessarily based entirely off of like a photo scan. But on 11, they had the photo scan technology. And so we're getting things like characters like Shang Tsung, for example, and he's literally the actor from the movie. It's Kerry Tagawa in the game. And we haven't <laughs> had that since the very first uh, three Mortal Kombat. Um, so it was really something special. I mean, I. I it really was serene. I, I, I still almost can't believe that I had the opportunity to work on this franchise. The people who are at the helm uh, were not really conservative at all about the franchise. They were like, look, uh, if you want to sound like Mortal Kombat, it's not hard. Just use the octatonic mode and a lot of percussion. That's fine. Now that you have that sound, go off and do whatever you like. Um, and then we had this great cinematics director, Mari Stoltz. What's great about our relationship is that we both kind of think big in a way that's not very typical in Hollywood these days. We both, we're, we're not afraid to have like big gestures and big moments. And you can clearly see this, especially in the um, vanilla MK11, these big moments, you know. Uh, Cassie comes back to see Johnny Cage after uh, Sonya's been, been killed. Do you have a favorite track that you composed for the story mode of, well, okay, from, I guess, the DLC as well, if you want, like, from mm. Mortal Kombat? I really did like uh, working with Fujin's theme, uh, especially, like, there's a scene where Fujin is fighting uh, Kronika alongside uh, Shang Tsung, oddly enough, and uh, eventually Raiden. And it just was a nice opportunity to have a gigantic wall of sound orchestra and choir and big percussion and everything kind of coming together. Uh, 
then in the main game, uh, there were a lot of moments that were a lot of fun to score. I think the one that stands out and that I think the fans liked as well were there's this huge flashback moment where it's revealed that uh, Raiden and Liu Kang have been fighting and always brought into con conflict with each other across many different games in Mortal Kombat past, which then reveals this sort of multiverse theory of like, hey, actually there's multiple timelines going on and Kronika is manipulating all of them and then resetting until she finally perfects her plan. And uh, I think when Rich and Marty sent me that scene, they were probably expecting some kind of like action music or whatever, like I'd been doing for the rest of the game. Um, but there were two issues with that. One, uh, it was so frenetic and all these time shifts, like every five seconds it shifts to a new scenery and a new timeline, the same uh, animation, I mean, it's such a gorgeous scene, but a new backdrop, new costumes, everything. Uh, so it would have been disjointed. And two, uh, we were running really low on time <laughs> and I needed something fast and uh, doing these epic action numbers, it's uh, incredibly time consuming. So uh, I had the idea of, well, why don't I take a huge step back? And instead of doing action at all, I had this like pulsing organ. So it's just this organ, big church organ chords and then loud choir that eventually joins in. And it just kind of grows. It's just like one note every uh, quarter note or something like that. But it just keeps growing and growing and growing until the scene ends and uh, eventually it just kind of stops. Again, that's just one of those cases where uh, you know, Marty uh, was always down with anything that I, I gave if it, if it fit the drama and the, uh, the emotion. And um, Rich as well, you know, he was always very encouraging of me doing something different that maybe wasn't so obvious. You've got a lot of experience working on Star Wars games. Did you try and emulate the signature John Williams Star Wars soundtrack? Yeah, so every every Star Wars score is kind of different with this, um, which I'm, I'm hoping people are, are starting to figure out by now that every Star Wars score, um, especially the ones not written by John Williams, of course, the, I should say every Star Wars game score kind of has a different approach. So you have some scores like the Battlefront series, which are intentionally as close to the Williams sound as they can get. And then you have scores like Jedi Fallen Order, which are still quite Williams-y, but they can take a little bit of a, a different direction. And uh, then at the extreme end, you have things like Mandalorian, which are, are rather different. And so all of the, the scores that I've worked on, they all kind of fit somewhere. The thing about Star Wars music as well is that there's very little you can do with an orchestra that John Williams hasn't already done in the nine movies that he's explored. Mm -hmm. There's very little that you can do that he hasn't already explored in some way. Um, which is great because it, it, it kind of means that with few exceptions, writing for Star Wars isn't limiting. It's more like we just expect you to put a little bit of Star Wars spice in here every once in a while. Um, little things like the way the brass is voiced or things with the woodwinds or percussion or whatever. But as long as you kind of have that in a little bit, it's going to sound like Star Wars. How do you personally believe that a video game soundtrack can impact a player's emotion? How can it impact a player's emotion? Well, uh, the last game that I beat was uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake. And even though Mortal Kombat was my pretty much my first video game that I really dived into, uh, I've been a Final Fantasy VII fanatic for decades. I think easily it's my favorite OST in the last two generations, perhaps. And the reason why is that, number one, yeah, of course, it's incredibly well-written, well-arranged, well-produced, and all that. But that aside, they were so aware of exactly how, what, 23 or whatever, uh, players who'd been uh, Final Fantasy fans for like 20-something years, they knew exactly how you would feel at every single moment in the game. And they capitalized on that. 
they knew like, hey, you know, here's a moment of the game that's so iconic. Uh, you fall through the roof and you meet Aerith, or you know, you, uh, you know, all these little things that they know that the players are expecting to happen. And they always take like just slightly a little different direction with it and give you a little bit more info, give you a little bit more, um, more context and make it so much more real. Maybe you're not okay. <sighs> ah, he lives. Finally awake, are we? And I think the music does a, a huge amount of heavy lifting in making that happen. Way more, I think, than in a typical video game where music is, can be exceptionally good, but it's not going to have that 20 years of nostalgia behind it. Um, just putting you in tears every single time you hear it. Uh, I mean, it's it, it was unbelievable experience. And that's just the power, I think the unique power that video games, video game scores have. <laughs>